Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Jones Seminar. Uh, I'm Professor Saul Diamond uh, here at Thayer, and we have a, a guest today, uh, Aditya Rajagopal. And Aditya is a uh, visiting faculty in electrical engineering at Caltech, an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Southern California. And uh, he's also a, a founder and CTO of Chromacode, a medical diagnostics company, and is the inventor of Chromacode's core technology of combinatorial uh, signal multiplexing. Uh, previously, he was a researcher at uh, Google X, where he uh, worked on novel medical imaging methods. Uh, additionally, uh, DT has, been, uh, has an appointment as a visiting faculty at uh, an electrical at Caltech. I mentioned those. Um, he leads a research group exploring the interface between medicine and engineering. So uh, he completed his education at Caltech and has over 60 patents and publications. Uh, excited to hear his talk today on Measure What Matters, Engineering Approaches to Biology. So, Aditya, come on up. Thanks, Saul. Is this uh, mic's working? Great. The slides are not. About 50% of the way there. Great. Awesome. All right, thank you for your uh, time, and Saul, thank you for hosting me for this uh, visit. Um, so I'm going to talk about things that I get excited about, uh, which has kind of been my adventure in science, basically. And the interesting thing is that adventure as a graduate student sort of started here uh, with Saul and, uh, and Greg Sangalas, who's in, in the audience uh, uh, here as well. Um, when I was a graduate student at Caltech, my first year, uh, I spent a, a fair number of months here at Dartmouth uh, exploring uh, both neuroscience with Saul and uh, pathology with Greg. And um, you'll see how those uh, elements uh, have been part of, my, uh, part of my science exploration to date. Um, so as sort of a, a broad theme, uh, really in new engineering approaches and new tools have become uh, a way for us to look at really small phenomena. So here, for example, in these view graphs, you can see um, light microscopy helping us image uh, cell mitosis. And you can see electron beam microscopy that helps us look at things like MEMS uh, display elements. The bottom there is, is a, a device called a DLP, a digital light uh, uh, projector display, um, as well as uh, interesting physiology. You can take a look on the view graph to the right. Uh, that's an SEM of a fly's, uh, fly's eye. It's a, it's a really strange compound uh, eye. And these new tools, as I started using them and leveraging them to look at biology, I got really interested in understanding the underlying biology itself. Uh, and flies in particular got me really uh, really stoked. Uh, and that's because uh, flies are these really, really small, tiny creatures that have an insanely complex flight dynamic system that's governed by only 50 neurons. It's kind of crazy. We have, you know, there's all these uh, problems that we're having with airplanes having man-made flight dynamic systems and errors in the safety protocols for, for an airplane maintaining flight. But for a fruit fly maintaining flight, it only takes 50 neurons to make sure that that fly, uh, fly is actually airborne. And, and how this works is, uh, you know, flies flap left to generate lift, if they, but if they don't want to fly left, they have to flap right in order to torque balance the, the fly itself. If, if that doesn't happen, they just kind of roll over uh, like this. Um, so as a result of trying to maintain a straight path of flight, um, they've developed a second set of wings. Uh, they're called the haltiers that are on the back of the, back of the uh, fly. And these wings aren't ones that generate lift, but instead are ones that uh, are strain sensors. So when a fly flaps left, the strain sensor on the right senses that the fly has flapped left, and these 50 neurons integrate uh, optical cortex measurements with strain-sensitive uh, measurements from the hind wings and tell the fly that it has to flap right. So when I started getting interested in fruit fly dynamics, I thought, thought to myself, hey, uh, I'm an engineer. I could probably build something to control those 50 neurons, so then I can make the fly flap whichever way I want it to, uh, to flap. Um, so, so this was a, it was an interesting thought experiment, um, but we started to make some headway to make it into reality. Um, so we took a look at how neurons are currently measured. Uh, and so uh, this was a Nobel Prize winning invention, but basically the, the state of the art for measuring a neuron is to take a glass pipette and pull it into a really, 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 really thin tube 
and stick it straight into the neuron, and you, and you just sort of, you just suck literally with your mouth, not, not even figuratively, you literally suck it with your mouth, and that ruptures the uh, neuron's cell membrane, and you can measure a voltage potential across the, the cell itself. And as a neuron fires, you'll see that the voltage potential changes. So in the view graph to the top right, you can see, for example, a, a spike uh, in neural, neural activity. Um, so this patch clamp setup is very effective at measuring neurons and could be used for measuring a fruit fly's neurons, uh, but it's too big. You know, the, the fly is, is the size of the head of the patch clamp, uh, and, and the fly brain is significantly smaller. We certainly wouldn't make any headway uh, with using this patch clamp setup uh, for looking at a fly. Um, so, so really, the problem was that we had a size problem. Uh, neurons are microns small, and glass pipettes are centimeters big. Um, so we thought to ourselves, maybe there's a way for us to shrink the patch pipette so that it can fit and interface with the neuron itself. Um, so that's kind of what we did, and we figured, you know, let's just go ahead and put that entire amplifier in the cell itself. It might be the most convenient way to do it. Um, and the best amplifier we could think of uh, was a Bell Labs invention that's uh, become ubiquitous at this point, which is the transistor. Uh, it's a device that very effectively lets us amplify voltage signals, or conversely, lets us convert between uh, uh, current signals to voltage signals. Um, so we figured we had to build a transistor to fit it inside the cell. And if we could do that, if we make something that small, uh, then we'd be in business. Uh, so the first thing we turned to uh, was uh, nanofabrication facilities. Uh, we, we happened to have access to a very nice clean room at Caltech. Uh, and, and in the clean room, we had all, all the right equipment uh, for silicon fabrication. So we could sculpt silicon and mold it uh, to generate a transistor that was the size of the cell itself. Uh, and that's, that's kind of what, what we did. We took uh, pattern transfer uh, methods that are, uh, really have driven the, uh, the semiconductor in industry forward, uh, and they're great for making these features that are flat. So you can make arrays of, of chipsets, and, and the nanofabrication facility had all of uh, these uh, capabilities, but that wasn't sufficient. Uh, cells aren't planar. They're little goops, and they're round, and some, they're not quite spherical. They're oblong, and you, and you have to have transistors that match the shape, shape of the measurement you're making. Um, so we really had to sculpt the silicon itself. Uh, so as part of this process, uh, we built tools at Caltech. We built our own plasma etchers, and we developed uh, etching techniques. Here you can see that we've um, sort of beveled uh, a, silica, a groove in, in a silicon wafer. And with these types of plasma etching techniques that have now become standard and are incorporated into many um, existing uh, etching uh, and silicon fabrication platforms, we're, we were able to define very, very small transistors. Um, and we also used a focused ion beam, which is, a, which is an instrument that marries a uh, scanning electron microscope with a, a gun that fires gallium bullets uh, at whatever you, you point it at. And, and we can actually, with brute force, define these beautiful little transistors that we could uh, fit into cells. Uh, so you can see a view graph of those uh, at the bottom here. And, and the interesting thing as we were exploring this is sort of a, a, a weird aside. We were building these uh, really, really small transistors, uh, and uh, we f found that there was this really uh, funny phenomenon that, uh, that we'd observe when we would expose these transistors to to air, they'd form a layer of rust, silicon dioxide, glass on the, on the uh, uh, outer surface. Uh, but no matter how much oxygen or temperature we would expose these transistors to, the layer of glass wouldn't grow. And this is not an uh, intuitive phenomenon. If you're familiar with how um, people form glass layers on things like silicon, the higher you heat up a piece of silicon, uh, the, temp the higher the temperature for the piece of silicon, the more the gaseous oxygen diffuses into the surface. Um, and, and we weren't finding that when we, when we had built these really small trans transistors, and it's, it was very counterintuitive. Uh, most of the physics was uh, uh, defined for this type of solid diffusion was defined by a guy named Andy Groove, uh, who, amongst other things, was the uh, CEO of Intel. Um, but before he was the CEO of Intel, he was a phenomenal physicist, uh, and he had come up with the governing equations that, that really uh, control solid diffusion uh, of, uh, of gases. Uh, but what we found is that as you take silicon and you rust it at these very, very tiny uh, size scales, you know, 75 nanometers on the side, uh, what happens is that the silicon crystal itself, as it rusts, starts to expand, and the silicon atoms start to push against each other, uh, and you form a, a nice little strain layer. And in this strain layer, it, it's just, uh, just stressful enough on all the atoms that it doesn't allow any more uh, 
oxygen to diffuse inside. And that's an important property that, that we exploited for this transistor, and I'll show you this cross-section in a moment for what that means. But this was kind of a nice phenomenon that came out of building new, uh, new set of sensors with the new set of tools that we had to put together ourselves. Um, so with this process, what we were able to do was to define these uh, really skinny transistors uh, that have a, uh, have a silicon core but a glass sheet, and that allowed us to mimic the type of glass pipette uh, that you'd stick into a neuron. Uh, and, and so this was really the, the start of the, the sensor system that we would use to measure the neurons uh, uh, themselves. And, and then we figured out that um, you know, cells don't really like silicon. They're not very happy playing with biology. So what we did is we took uh, a, a metal deposition system. We put very fine layers of metal on top of this transistor, and we grew layers of uh, platinum, gold, and platinum, just a few nanometers uh, thick at a time. Uh, and in this process, we were able to create a layer that mimics the uh, hydrophilicity uh, and the hydrophobicity of the uh, phospholipid bilayer of the neurons themselves. So by uh, building this biomimetic structure, uh, we built a nice analog to a, a glass uh, patch pipette uh, clamp but at the size scale of 75 uh, nanometers on the head. Um, so, so we tested these out in, in, a, in a scanning electron microscope. It's kind of, it's really hard to actually pinpoint these guys since they're so small. So we had to uh, build a specialized stage in order to do that, but we had tested these devices to make sure they actually were transisting and they were amplifying a, uh, a simulated neural signal. And uh, once we did that, uh, we figured we were all the way there, um, but turned out that wasn't quite true. Uh, we'd built a really small sensor that we couldn't connect to and we couldn't power. Uh, so there's no point in building a, a small uh, patch pipette if you still need the bigger setup, uh, and it's not very useful for measuring uh, the fruit fly uh, or the behaving neuron. So what we realized is that we would have to still uh, build a, way to, uh, a power source and, and a data link on the size of, of the neuron itself. Um, so that's, that's what we attempted to do. So we, we took our uh, background in silicon fabrication, and we built uh, photodiodes in, in the silicon wafer itself. We looked at other material systems that, unlike silicon, are very efficient at converting light into uh, electric current, so gallium arsenide being one of those uh, substrates. And we mated them with uh, really small uh, vertical cavity lasers. Um, and so we took all of these things and built a small circuit uh, to uh, to uh, power this uh, neural sensor. And with the system, we were able to, um, with rat hippocampal neurons, uh, measure uh, action potentials. So, uh, Saul, you might notice this, this waveform here. This is, this is one of the wavelet transforms that you did for us early on. But uh, this, the platform itself was uh, great for understanding uh, a behaving neuron. So it was uh, a demonstration that you can build tools. When you build tools the size scale of biology, uh, you can get uh, novel results. So you know the, the good part was that we could measure the neurons. The bad part uh, is that fruit flies don't have a long lifespan when you decapitate them, and so there's no there's no there's no uh, utility in, in trying to control a fruit fly. But however, uh, it, it does open up a new venue for us to uh, translate this type of a measurement platform into organisms where that is a feasibility to have a continuous uh, uh, monitoring system. Um, so since, we've taken that same platform and adapted it to measuring other types of analytes. So for example, you can uh, functionalize the top of that transistor with enzymes, as an example, uh, glucose dehydrogenase or glucose oxidase. And when you put this type of measurement platform inside, uh, say, a, a fingernail, you can measure uh, the continuous, uh, continuously measure the glucose levels uh, in the bloodstream. So there are applications that are beyond neural sensing that still leverage the same size scale effects that you get when you have the nanoscale sensors. Uh, and similarly, you can also take these sensors and you can put them into oil wells and you can look at things like fracking efficiencies. So there's, there's a lot of applications that, are, uh, that we've tested out that are beyond, beyond the biological. Um, uh, but along the way, I, I got interested in, in another phenomenon that I'd, I'd taken a look at, which was this uh, process of natural DNA replication. Uh, as an engineer, I, I, really the last biology class I took was high school, uh, high school biology. And, uh, and I didn't have sort of the broad exposure that others might have had in the field. So uh, in part, one of the interesting things uh, for me was to discover that there was a, a chemical engineer that had replicated uh, in, in a test tube uh, a, a way, uh, replicated DNA replication 
which was naturally happening in cells all the time, but, by, but in a test tube by just controlling the temperature. It was crazy. He'd figured out that uh, you can take enzymes that replicate DNA naturally in uh, thermophilic bacteria, and you can put them into test tubes, and as you cycle the temperature from a cold state to a hot state, you can activate and deactivate this enzyme to synthetically replicate uh, DNA. It was a uh, phenomenal invention, Kerry Mullis, the, the Nobel laureate, uh, and it's, it's probably single-handedly the most important uh, discovery in biology this uh, last century. Um, and since he discovered this, uh, uh, this effect about 40 years ago, a number of... Uh, Industries have developed around it, uh, one around the, uh, the engineering of uh, DNA templates for things like CRISPR gene editing, and another for uh, detecting uh, latent DNA in things like uh, blood samples, so you can test for the presence or absence of different pathogens or the presence or absence of different uh, cancer markers. Uh, but the problem is all these uh, uh, instrument systems that have been developed are very expensive. They're large, large things the size of this table. They're bulky. They're expensive to run. Uh, they take a long time to run the reaction. Uh, they aren't designed for uh, quick, rapid experiments. Um, so I did what probably any engineer does. I, uh, I broke into a biology lab after hours, and I took one apart and said, hey, I could probably build it, uh, and, and did exactly that. So using my cell phone uh, and a small cartridge that I had built out of PCBs, like a 20 cent part, I was able to replicate the, uh, the chemical sensitivity of this PCR polymerase chain reactor that multiplied DNA. Um, and along the way, I started to ask some questions on, on how these machines were actually quantifying the amount of DNA that was present in the, in the chambers. Uh, and, and I uh, took a deeper look at how the existing instruments did that. And the way they do that is by uh, associating a, the generation of a fluorescent signal as a function of time with the presence or absence of and concentration of a particular gene or a particular infectious disease target. And these machines themselves uh, uh, marry a optical uh, filter and sensor system with a chemical reaction chamber that's being thermally cycled. And by looking at the fluorescence intensity in discrete color channels, you can look at discrete genes that are uh, being amplified in this uh, polymerase chain reactor. It's actually, it was, this method was um, invented by another guy named Russ Higuchi, uh, who was unfortunately 10 years too late to, to win the Nobel Prize himself, uh, uh, was given to Kerry Mullis instead. Um, but but the, the thing is that in these types of fluorescent reactions, you basically are looking for the presence or absence of light in, in this particular experiment, but you're not paying any attention to the amplitude of that signal at all. And as an engineer, I figured there's probably a more efficient way to encode for information. And amplitude and modulation is something that we're all familiar with as, as engineers, and I figured that that's something that we could apply to these types of detection systems to increase the information content. You could take systems that are capable of measuring four things, and sort of virtually promote them into systems that are capable of measuring 20 things. Uh, and so we came up with a, a few different um, en encoding schema that allowed us to look at the intensity of any given signal that's being generated by a reaction and uh, came up with a method to encapsulate that encoding scheme in, in chemistry and came up with a method to encapsulate the decoding scheme in an algorithm to look at the outputs. Um, so, so the way that works is kind of simple. When you run a PCR reaction, it's a DNA synthesis reaction that involves four components. Uh, you have to have the uh, uh, template DNA that you're uh, trying to amplify itself. You have to have a set of uh, what's known as primers, which are complementary, synthetic complementary uh, pieces of DNA that bracket the region of interest that you're looking for. Uh, and you have to have free base pairs. Uh, these are the ATGs and Cs in the reaction mixture. And you have to have uh, enzymes to create uh, the PCR reaction itself. Um, but in order to measure it, you have to have an additional component, which is, which is a fluorescence reporter. It is a transducer for uh, the, uh, the PCR process itself. So you can correlate the generation of a fluorescent signal with running this PCR chemistry. Um, but with these, all these components, these are all arrhenius reactions that are controlled by temperature and concentration. So a way to control the endpoint intensity or the amplitude of the, of the signal that's generated in one of these reactions is to really uh, control the ratios of the different components with one another. And if you force the ratios of, of all the reactants that are needed to be rate-limited 
by the amount of probe, the, the fluorescent uh, signal generating element, you can very fine tune, uh, fine control the endpoint intensity of a PCR curve. Uh, and so as, as the enzyme replicates, you generate a signal and then, and then with the concentration you can control it. So you can take a target, uh, any gene, say it's, it's, a, it's a BRCA1 marker as an example, and uh, you can generate a chemistry that uh, generates a, a deterministic signal of say 200 if that particular marker is present. Um, and by using a second reporting, non-reporting probe molecule, effectively like an interfering RNA type mechanism, you can actually fine tune that to basically a tenth of a, a, tenth, tenth of a, a fluorescent unit on, on most of these detection systems. It, it maps back to about 1,000 thousand photon counts uh, uh, per time step. And, and so there's a very uh, clever, it's kind of a clever way to take an existing instrument and uh, really map that optical dynamic range into a, a much tighter controlled uh, space. And what, what that lets us do is we can take a set of PCR reagents, which may be used for measuring cancer markers like a BRCA1, and we can uh, engineer a cocktail to have a very deterministic signature. So for example, we can take that BRCA1 marker and have it generate a signal of 50 by putting in 50 nanomolars of probe, or gen generate a signal of 100 by, by putting in 100 nanomolars of probe, um, and or generate a signal of 350 by putting in 350 nanomolars of probe. There's a linear map between the concentration of the reporter and the signal that's generated. Um, but what you can also do is take multiple uh, genes that you're looking for, or multiple targets, and give them each a unique intensity signature. Uh, for example, uh, target A can be mapped to a signal of 50 with 50 nanomolars of probe, and target B to a signal of 100 with 100 nanomolars of probe. And what this lets you do is, is map any unique combination of targets to a unique fluorescent signature. So that mapping really allowed us to take existing instruments and enable you know, five to 10 times as, uh, as number of measurements as you normally would be able to do. Um, but amplitude modulation does require a few other things. Most of these instruments aren't built for uh, making these fine fluorescent measurements. So there's a whole, whole bunch of signal processing that you have to do to accommodate for things like thermal uniformity across the instrument itself. And there's a lot of modeling we had to do to understand the physics of, of uh, the way the thermal blocks worked and sort of the model the heat equation with some uh, finite, you know, finite element analysis to, to look at the non-uniformity of the temperature profile. But when we apply these correction factors, we were able to get these types of very clean signals. So here in this view graph, what you can see is, a, uh, is an, a, an assay we developed for uh, a set of respiratory targets. It's, it's uh, nine pathogens that are measured in uh, three channels of a PCR instrument that at that point could only really measure three, three things at once. Uh, and what you're seeing here superimposed uh, on a single slide is a series of curves uh, that represent uh, individual samples that were measured. Uh, uh, and what, what you have to look for here is that for any given sample, uh, any given gene target that was present, for example, the RSVB uh, viral target present in a sample, it always terminates in a deterministic band. So, so again, it goes back down to any combination of targets or any individual target with this type of encoding scheme has a unique fluorescent signature uh, that it maps to. Um, so this was a uh, sort of a phenomenal um, uh, lever for us to use because we could uh, take the uh, uh, equipment that had already been in labs and uh, had already been installed in labs, like at Dartmouth, uh, and we could enable them to measure things they just couldn't uh, measure before. Uh, and, and the nice thing here is that you can not only get out uh, target identities if you're looking at things like viral panels, but you can also decompose the curve uh, virtually into a set of icon curves for each of these targets, which also lets us, for example, look at concentrations of targets. So a lot of these um, types of viruses are co-present in, in clinical specimen. So it gives us a good way of interrogating not only combinations, but concentrations of things. Um, and then, then we started to think about uh, encoding schemes in general and, and found that this was one that happened to be uh, uh, maximally uh, uh, information dense when all targets had to be present, but that there was an opportunity to leverage unused portions of this code space uh, to look for more targets uh, uh, if, if a few of them might not be present. Um, so that, that sounds a bit abstract, but I'll sort of uh, put it into terms that, uh, that, I, that I understand. Uh, if you look at uh, cell phone towers, uh, when, when 
uh, companies like Verizon buy spectrum, they may buy, uh, say, 50 megahertz of, of bandwidth at 700 megahertz uh, of spectrum. And if you assume that a phone conversation uh, takes up uh, about five, five kilohertz of space, that means you can fit 10,000 uh, simultaneous phone conversations in, a, uh, in the spectrum that Verizon has, uh, has purchased. But we all know that Verizon doesn't have just 10,000 customers. They, they wi widely advertise that they have 30, 30 million subscribers. And the way they enable 30 million customers to talk on 10,000 channels is by time interleaving them. So they're careful about how they combine those conversations in this encoding space. And that's how we extract out, uh, uh, extra information from those radio signals and how we can support 30 million uh, phone conversations simultaneously. And when you apply the same type of logic to the way you do combinatorial labels, you can actually increase the number of, uh, uh, for example, the number of genes that you're measuring all at once. Um, so we uh, applied this type of encoding principle to uh, the same flu, flu target panel. And then we started to see um, something real nice. We, we found that we could um, basically interrogate a target with a spread spectrum code that allowed us to increase the um, sensitivity that we'd be uh, measuring those targets, but also uh, increase the resilience to the types of uh, inhibiting factors or types of strain vari variants that you measure in field. Um, so with this method, we actually uh, figured out that this was a way for us to discover new strain variants in, in real life measurements, um, because we have code spaces that, for example, uh, will uh, exhibit a drop in fluorescence if a particular strain variant is, is present. Um, so the encoding space itself has an error correction uh, property that allows us to uh, map intensities to combinations of viruses, but also has a sensitivity that allows us to discriminate different strain variants. Um, so some of our ambitions is to, is to, of course, start to monitor disease trends across, across the country as they pop up. And this type of a uh, technical approach gives us a lever to do that. And as we started to explore the space, we found that there was actually a, a full uh, spectrum of different types of encoding strategies, each with different properties. And as an, as an example, the checksum encoding that we came up with uh, is one that is maximally error correcting. There's one, other ones that are closer to what we call barcode encoding that give you things that are um, maximally information dense if there's only one, one thing that you're measuring that's present. Um, so all of these, these methods have uh, enabled this new type of information dense measurements. Um, so we tried to apply this to different fields. PCR was a great one. And the next problem we were interested in solving is the one of non-invasive uh, prenatal testing. Uh, when uh, early in a, in a mother's pregnancy, uh, you can actually draw a mother's blood. And that mo the mother's blood will actually have a proportion of DNA that's actually sloughed off from the fetus itself. Uh, and so you can very finely, finely measure this if you have a gene sequencer. Uh, and you can actually discriminate which portions of the, uh, the free-floating DNA in the bloodstream correspond to the mother and which portions correspond um, to the baby. In the process of doing that, um, uh, someone realized very early on that you could also use this to predict what the, uh, the genome of the, the fetus was. And for certain disorders, uh, like uh, having a trisomy 21, Down syndrome, uh, there's a, a strong uh, need for parents to have uh, an early diagnosis of that for the fetus, because it gives them time to prepare for the care care of the child. And for other disorders, uh, like tri trisomy 13, um, that ends up in being a, a fatal pregnancy. The, 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 the fetus, unfortunately, doesn't survive. So giving uh, uh, potential parents the uh, opportunity to have that information early on is a very important, uh, important thing. Uh, so for that, PCR is no longer a very effective tool, because you have to finally discriminate one part in 100 to determine whether a piece of DNA is from comes from a baby or from a fetus. Uh, but there is another tool that looks very similar to PCR that's still used for DNA detection, uh, which does have that quantitative capability. Uh, and that's its uh, term digital PCR. A guy named Rustam Ismagilov at the University of Chicago came up, uh, came up with this method. And his theory was as follows. You can take a sample uh, containing DNA and potentially containing PCR enzymes and PCR primers and free base pairs. And you can partition it into a 10,000 small little chambers. And when you partition a sample physically into 10,000 individual chambers, the probability that you have a piece of DNA that you're looking for in any given chamber uh, 
tends to be very binary. Either it's present or it's not. Or said another way, you can each chamber becomes a digital measurement. If you measure light in it, that means that a piece of DNA was present. If a different chamber doesn't measure light in it, that means that uh, there was no DNA present. So this, this actually gives uh, uh, folks a, a great lever to take a sample that's very dilute for the gene that you're looking for, like, for example, fetal DNA in, in blood, and gives you a uh, way to quantitate how much of that DNA is present. So uh, on the top, you can see how this looks in terms of typical experimental uh, work uh, when you run a test for, say, chromosome 21. In, in a maternal blood sample, you'll end up with a population of uh, partitions or, or bubbles that don't have any DNA from chromosome 21 present, and a partition that does have a much smaller partition that has uh, uh, fragments from chromosome 21 present. Um, so you can get a, uh, you, you see here on the very right, you'll get a peak for, uh, for no, uh, bubbles that are dark that don't have it, and a smaller peak for bubbles that are positive and do, do have it. But when you apply the same type of information-dense encoding, we can actually get out information on multiple chromosomes in a single measurement. So by looking at the shade or the, or the grade of the uh, fluorescent signal, you can generate a, a, a signature that has multiple clusters that, for example, cluster A corresponds to chromosome 21, cluster B corresponds to chromosome 13, and you, you can generate clusters that correspond to both of those genes being present in a single chamber. Um, and, and what that ultimately lets us do is provide a, a new paradigm for how these uh, tests are being performed that, are, uh, that give us uh, the ability to screen for uh, Down syndrome and, and a couple other uh, trisomies and other genetic inherited disorders at a very early stage in pregnancy. About 10 weeks within the pregnancy, we can make a prediction on whether or not um, a fetus has any of these disorders. Uh, but we can also do this because of the way we're approaching it at an exceptionally low cost. And that's important because uh, these tests that are currently performed, that are currently performed using expensive, even more expensive gene sequencing machines that tend to be about a million bucks, uh, are about a thousand bucks a pop. And with this type of an information-dense approach, again, no new uh, instruments we've developed, just a different way of rearranging the chemicals, we can build tests that cost us $5. So uh, this is a way for us to really broaden the access to genetic tools that are uh, important for medical diagnosis. Um, with that said, uh, I want to move on to a slightly different topic, which is uh, my more recent uh, uh, for my work. Uh, with, my, with my wife, I've been uh, really thinking through uh, opportunities to take uh, ultrasound and make that into a much more low cost, much more point of care uh, system. Uh, so the, you know, the observation we made is uh, when my wife went from California to the Philippines, um, she traded her stethoscope for, uh, sorry, uh, her ultrasound for a stethoscope. And those are vastly different in their technical capabilities. Uh, and, and the real reason that uh, she wasn't able to have an ultrasound uh, where she was at was because it's too expensive uh, and it's not portable. It's just not feasible. Uh, and, and so the question was, well, what can, what can we do to make a stethoscope look more like an ultrasound? Um, and before we did that, we wanted to take a look, you know, what actually makes these ultrasounds um, so complicated? Well, uh, ultrasounds are, uh, are, are a very complex machine uh, where you take a, sort of taking an acoustic wave and you put it into a tissue and you look for a uh, reflection off of a, a, a you know, contrast boundary. It could be a, a, the boundary between a bone and, and tissue or between two, two different types of tissue or vasculature. And you can interpret those echoes to form an image. Uh, but in doing so, uh, what you're doing is you're, uh, you're actually taking a set of uh, uncorrelated uh, signals in order to form a image of something very specific. And, and solving, uh, in general, making a general purpose imager with ultrasound is, is very expensive. And it's expensive uh, and it's power hungry. And it's not only uh, expensive from a hardware perspective, it's expensive from a software perspective. It's a very uh, computationally intensive uh, procedure. It solves a in general inverse imaging problem. Um, so our thoughts were, there's probably a way uh, we can uh, build a point of care ultrasound that has simplified hardware, but maybe sophisticated algorithms to report back on very specific methods, uh, metrics. Something that's not a general purpose imager, but something that could, for example, report back on, specifically report back on heart rate or blood pressure. 
other metrics that we can um, synthesize with a, a reduced uh, complexity platform. Um, so we built a, a set of algorithms to do a few key features in this process uh, to pull out um, blood pressure from, uh, from the blood. And, and the first thing you need to do if you want to pull out a metric like blood pressure with ultrasound um, is you have to measure the blood velocity, uh, blood velocity itself. Um, it's a, a, you know, arteries are basically like pipes that change their width over time. And as they're changing their width, uh, they change their width as a bolus of blood goes through. And you can measure this bolus of blood by shining an acoustic wave onto the artery and looking at the Doppler shift of the, of the sound that you receive back. And by looking at the shift in wavelength, you can actually uh, determine through the Doppler shift the velocity of the blood particles that's going through. Uh, and, and so we, we built a simple sensor system with two pixels to do this. This is, um, this is pretty um, easy to put together, um, but it's not the entire uh, part of the puzzle. Uh, and so, so we, we built a simple uh, system to replicate what already happens in a clinical ultrasound, um, but you still need to look at how wide the artery gets in this process, because to get true blood pressure, that is a parameter you need to uh, accommodate for. So we spent some time uh, taking uh, ultrasound images with this comp uh, complex clinical ultrasound uh, sensor that has 100, 128 uh, imaging pixels, uh, and we came up with a machine learning algorithm to predict the uh, distension of the artery or the width of the artery. Uh, we did this with a convolutional neural network. We basically took a bunch of uh, clinical images that we uh, had uh, physicians tag on what was an artery and what wasn't an artery. And then we trained our model to predict uh, which, which pixels were part of the artery and which pixels weren't part of the artery. So for example, in this view graph on the left, you can see a uh, image of an artery that was taken with a clinical ultrasound. In the view graph on the right, you can see a probability distribution uh, for uh, our uh, model uh, to predict what's part of the artery and what's not. So here on the right, the uh, pixels in deep red uh, are closer to probability one, that that pixel happens to be part of the artery, and the pixels uh, in dark blue are correspond to probability uh, zero that, uh, that the pixel is part of the artery. So. Um, and with this type of an approach, we could actually find, finally define uh, the width of the artery itself. So by combining the blood velocity measurement with this reduced sensor system with the arterial distension measurement uh, with the machine learning algorithm, uh, we have the uh, key metrics to inform on continuous blood pressure. Uh, and, and it all happens in a, in a device that's uh, small enough to fit into a stethoscope at a price point and a power budget that's feasible uh, uh, for any doctor and any, any medical practitioner to have. Um, so, so this is sort of the, the new flavor of research uh, we're performing where we're taking complex systems and simplifying them for very specific uh, metrics that we're uh, looking for. So there's a few other uh, key parameters that we're adapting this platform for. Um, for example, we want to look at differential pressure for different parts of the human physiology. For example, radial artery pressure versus carotid pressure, or perhaps to look for calcification, which may inform on cardiac health, um, but also to look for uh, other things such as bone fractures that so might be a useful imaging tool for point of care medicine, or to look at things like lung sounds um, so you can identify whether or not a, a, a patient has an obstructed airway. Um, so these types of uh, simple imaging systems can enable specific, uh, specific measurements like that. And that's really driven by uh, uh, using a machine, uh, driven by machine learning as a computational lever for informing on these metrics. Um, you guys are likely familiar with all the advancement that has happened in the past few years on, uh, with machine learning from speech detection. A lot of this happens in our cell phones, if you have a smart assistant in your, in your cell phone, to object detection, which is uh, routinely happening in self-driving cars like the Tesla, um, and definitely in machine translation, which gives us a, the ability to, in real time, uh, uh, take, uh, take existing real-world information and augment it with virtual information, uh, like, for example, with Google's uh, machine translation software. Um, and really what's happening on these, uh, with these types of models is it's taking a very diverse, complex data set and computationally reducing it down to a mapping function where you go from uh, raw data to 
phenotypes or, or metrics that you're trying to measure. But the underlying process that maps the diverse data into outcomes actually likely has a very simple explanation. So in the case of the ultrasound sensor, for example, uh, the machine learning uh, algorithm found the artery, but we were able to replicate that same process by taking a signal processing approach to looking at gradients in the, uh, in, in the contrast of the ultrasound itself. So taking these types of uh, approaches really lets us, uh, lets us uh, enter a regime where we're uh, taking human skills and using that to uh, really uh, build a, a artificial intelligence that replicates uh, human, human uh, interpretation. So for ultrasound, as an example, we can use this type of a platform to take the institutional knowledge that a doctor has, an ultrasound specialist, specialist has, and encapsulate that into an algorithm that learns over time. Um, so for future directions with, with this work at Caltech, uh, what we're doing is building out uh, a set of ultrasound stethoscopes uh, for which we can uh, use, use that platform to measure a whole bunch of patients across uh, a number of cardiac parameters so that we can accurately detect blood pressure. Uh, and uh, once we have refined those uh, algorithms with large clinical data sets, we plan to um, take that forward into a number of other uh, metrics, uh, such as burn fractures and, and looking at differential pressure between radial and carotid arteries. Uh, and that really would be the basis of a new, new type of sensor platform that leverages the balance of millions of data sets in order to make predictions on, on the next data set. Um, so with that said, I, I want to thank a whole bunch of people that made this all possible for me from a variety of different organizations that, it, um, that I've had the opportunity to be part of. And in particular, I'd like to thank Saul Diamond for hosting me uh, at, at Dartmouth uh, for this visit. Thank you.